Welcome to A Thrivable Future, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world. Hi, I'm Rebecca from The Thrive Project. We're a not-for-profit tech and research forum. I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. This week, I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Rebecca English. She's a researcher and teacher at Queensland University of Technology, and she's primarily focused on parenting and education. She's especially interested in alternative education, such as democratic schools and home education. Her work explores the ways parenting beliefs and practices influence the choices they make in educating their children and how these choices affect children's experience of agency and autonomy. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Great name, by the way. Yeah. (laughs) So I did a little bit of reading on your work. There's so many fascinating topics. One of the big questions I had is, what is a democratic school? Oh my goodness. Democratic schools (laughs) exist everywhere around the world, but they're actually really hard to do in Australia. There's lots of different models of democratic schooling, but at their heart, all of them are about not having teachers sitting above young people, but having young people having space to be in control and have agency over their own learning. Okay, that's interesting. So you find that um, agency is a really important thing for children? Absolutely. I think people forget that, you know, we like to have agency over our lives. When you look at the workplace research, all of it shows that if you want to retain high quality staff and you want people to be engaged and, you know, active and informed participants in their work, then what you have to do is give them as much agency as possible. And children, I think, are no different. The thing with children that really gets me is, you know, when you think about it, you know, you wouldn't smack an adult, but you would smack a child and you wouldn't like shove an adult in the corner if they were kicking off because they are emotions <laughs> were going off, but you would with a child. You have to ask yourself, at what point do we go, this is not okay anymore and now we don't do this to you? That's definitely an interesting thing. I think that there's a balance that you've got to strike as well, right? Like you don't want to give children so much agency that they're doing things that are you know harmful for themselves or not doing things that they need to do right so you've got to I think that really with democratic schools well they would say that no and there are some homeschoolers who don't have any rules at all either wow so I think in some fairly extreme models of democratic schooling so let's take the A.S. Neal model from Summerhill which is celebrating its hundredth year this year At Summerhill, if you decide you don't want to turn up to a class, well, nobody comes and chases you. If you'd rather sit in a tree and swing off the branches, again, nobody chases you. But if you make lessons interesting and exciting and relevant and you relate it to what young people are really interested in and where they're going in their lives, then you'd be amazed because they'll want to turn up. Yeah, I can definitely see how that addresses one of the big problems with schooling in general, getting that engagement from students because you know, I, I remember being at school and, you know, everyone just not wanting to be there. It's, it's interesting because I actually am very, particularly as an adult, I've rediscovered a love of learning, but I didn't really have that same drive as, as a kid, certainly not for the topics that we were supposed to be. <laughs> I remember I would like, you know, sit in the corner of the library and privately research Greek myths and legends and things like that because I just found it really interesting. I can see how that's like going to be really, really great for kids. However, I know that Sustainable Development Goal 4, which is focusing on education, it revolves around access to equitable education levels and minimum proficiency levels in things like maths and literacy. So when you're talking about things like homeschooling and democratic schooling, how do you make sure that you're still achieving those minimum levels? Well, that's a super interesting question. If I could take homeschooling as an example, let's start with home ed and then we can move to democratic schools. The majority of people in Australia and in the Western world who choose to home educate, and it's called home education, not homeschooling, although I am so bad, Rebecca, I used to turn (laughs) homeschooling all the time and it's not school, it's home thing, right? Home education, the majority of them, and say in Australia, I would guess upwards of 80% of people who choose it, of the 26 odd thousand people last year who chose it, they're doing it not because they are passionately advocating for homeschooling, but because school for whatever reason, hasn't worked for their children. So Uh, there is a massive growth in home education and most of it is being driven by young people for whom school just hasn't really worked. So a lot of them are gifted 
or they're what the families would call twice exceptional. So they might be gifted, but ASD, so autism spectrum disorder, yeah. gifted or ADD, so attention deficit disorder, sometimes with hyperactivity, or they're kind of a square peg in a round hole. They just didn't really fit in at school. So the majority of people who come to it do so because school just didn't work for them. And their parents yeah. or really unhappy young people and for most parents, if school worked, believe me, they would send their kids back to school in a heartbeat. Yeah, of as course. In. So really, I think what's interesting about those sustainability goals is the tension between needing to provide a minimum education and that works best at school in the developing world and how people perceive education in the West. Yeah. I think part of what also plays into it really significantly is in the West in particular. So let's take Australia. When you hear governments talking about schools and talking about teachers, it's never really positive. So a few years ago, to become a teacher, you suddenly have to now do this test. So when I qualified 25 years ago, because I am ancient, I didn't have to do a test. I did my degree. I did another degree. Bam, I'm a teacher. But now you do this degree even if you're doing a master's degree, you still have to pass this test, this Lantite test, which is the literacy and numeracy for initial teacher education test. And right. while you're sitting there thinking, that's great, we should have a minimum level of numeracy and literacy for teachers, but we don't for nurses and we don't for doctors and we don't for marketing professionals and we don't for politicians. We do this to teachers. And part of what we construct when we force teachers to do this is we say, well, teachers are a bit innumerate and probably a bit illiterate too. So maybe we need to do something special for teachers. And then we also say that schools are failing young people. You know, we compare our results and we look at, you know, all of these things and we say, really, look, schools just aren't working. So I don't think it's any surprise that people in increasing numbers, particularly after COVID, have gone oh, hang on a minute, I would be a better teacher for my child than a school is. So I think really we have to step back as a community and question, what is it we're saying about schools? Testing for teachers, is that different depending on what they're teaching? All teachers have All to teach the land height. There's not like a passing grade per se. You have to get in the top whatever percentage in order to pass. Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. So that seems completely unnecessary. I can see a certain minimum level being needed for like primary school or general education teachers just because you're covering so much basics. But yeah, when you come to like a more specialist thing, I, I don't see that the numeracy skills of an art teacher are really relevant. <laughs> You know, they're doing a degree. It's a four-year undergraduate degree or a three-year undergraduate degree plus a two-year master's. These people aren't stupid. They have done well at school or well enough to get an accepted into a place in a tertiary institution. And if they complete the degree... That should be enough. Part of what we communicate is that schools aren't really great places. A lot of us remember back to our own experiences of schooling and maybe back in the day, it was kind of okay if you got bullied. But I think increasingly parents are more aware of the mental health consequences of these kind yeah. of experiences for young people. And for a lot of parents, they really saw for the first time during COVID what their young people were doing at school. And for many, they were like, oh, I'm not super happy. Maybe I could do better. Do you think that the children who are being educated at home miss out on some of the more like social aspects of learning and development? Socialization is on my bingo card right here. <laughs> I've always asked about socialization. I think that's a really interesting question. So when I talk to home educators, they have two responses to that. The first one is, are the social experiences young people have at school really great? So if they're being bullied and if they're having a rotten time, is yeah. that a really positive social experience? And the second one is that home educators live in the world. So rather than being at school where they're sort of trapped in a classroom for a lot of hours of the day with people who are roughly six months older or younger than them, they're out and about in the world. So they do all of the after school activities that mainstream school kids do. Yeah. Plus, they, you know, go to the shops and have a chat to the lady or the man at the counter or they'll go to the post office or they'll go to the chemist 
And then they'll join meetups and co-ops where they hang out with other home educated young people. I mean, you could seriously go to 10 co-ops a week if you really wanted to just in Southeast Queensland, because there are so many different groups. So yeah, I don't yeah. know if they necessarily miss out on socialization. They probably do miss out on some schooly type experiences, but do you think that we can like work on improving our mainstream education methods to actually better cater for individual learning needs? <laughs> 100%. So there are some really amazing schools in Australia doing really amazing work and not all of them are private. So in Terry Hills, there's an amazing state school and it has a waiting list for its waiting list, for example, and it does really amazing, very democratic work. Friday is project work. So they really only do lessons four days a week. They don't give out report cards that are punitive like we may remember they are not using a's to e's they're using different grading scale and the student themselves start off by looking at it then there are some private schools in new south wales again very similar and those private schools for reports don't give out do you remember that piece of paper with like you can tell the teachers just typed in a number to get like a, <laughs> or it's a number it's a system and you get it um when i was a teacher there was a teacher who I worked with who I won't name his name, but he was really lazy and he never wanted to do the reports. So he'd, he'd pay me to do the reports. Oh, and then wow. <laughs> I realized that, hey, you can play back to do it so she can do your reports for you. But anyway, um, so you just put in this number. They don't do that. They do a qualitative report. So they'd say, you know, this year, Rebecca was really friendly with this person, this person, and this person. And then, you know, she was really interested in her cat who I saw in your background. And she talked a lot about her cat and she wrote a story about her cat. And then, you know, she also in art drew pictures about her cat and she's really into Cluedo and board games and risk. So, you know, she did this with her friends a lot of the rainy days and then they invented their own game. And that's the kind of report that you get. And I think that's a lot of work though for teachers. And until we start to value teachers differently. Yeah, that support level for teachers really needs to be lifted for the the rest to sort of follow on I think like yeah you definitely see like you know the, the strain that teachers are under with lots of expectations not so great wages and no and, and I think the reason they <laughs> out of the profession right I mean the dropout rate is huge I remember them telling us we would last maybe five maybe seven years and I did my seven and then it was just overwhelming I just I couldn't do it anymore and I think that's also what needs to be addressed are there any other reasons that people choose to homeschool? Yes. So you're alluding to the religious element. Yeah. <laughs> so when I look at my work, my contribution to the field, I'm going to toot my own horn now because, you know, that's what we do as an academic because ain't nobody tooting my horn for me. <laughs> I argue that there are two groups of home educators. The first one is that accidental. People who fall into it because school just didn't work. Most people fall into that category. The second group are more hardcore about homeschooling and they, I mean, I say 20%. I don't know if it's even that high. And we've known about them since the 90s. Van Galen wrote this amazing chapter about ideologues and pedagogues. And I see them as deliberates. They're people who were always going to homeschool. There might be religious accidentals, but that's not necessarily their reason for doing it. They would probably yeah. prefer to send their children to some sort of school where really, if I'm honest, Rebecca, they're going to learn exactly the same things that they're learning at home. So banning homeschooling, for example, which is often proposed, isn't going to fix that. But I think part of what we have to do as a community is understand that there's no law against parents telling their children that the world is 6,000 years old, just as there's no law against me telling my kids that, you know, Indigenous Australians have been on this land for 26,000 years, right? So I think this is part of what we see in home education is really kind of a microcosm of the tensions that we live in yeah. in modern liberal democracies. I suppose the question is more about a child's right to information. For example, I think most people would maybe accept a, a parent's right to tell a child that the earth is 6,000 years old, but the question of whether they have the right to restrict access to alternative information because I, I think that's been a big uh, co controversy especially in the US um, some extent in Australia is what can you teach in a public setting and removing references to certain events or narratives and textbooks and a lot of concern over sex education how does that impact children's development and how do we resolve those tensions 
you know, Rebecca, I think if I could resolve those tensions, I, I would be like super millionaire, right? I think part of the problem is as a community, we haven't really thought about what it means to be a well-educated Australian. I think we need to have that conversation. And while I would never tell my children that the world is 6,000 years old, I would tell them that people believe that and they might well see that. If you're interested in how the world works, it's actually a really interesting microcosm of all the different groups vying for power politically and socially in yeah. the Western world at the moment. So we see more people coming to home education who I would class as accidentals, but they, this is where my theory probably comes a bit unstuck actually, because of say COVID mandates. So there are new groups of families and they're sort of 50-50, 50-50, nobody should tell me I have to vaccinate my child, heads up, nobody was going to. Um, but it's never been a law. You have to vaccinate your kid for anything in a public school, you know, free, secular, open to everybody. So there's that fear about being told they have to vaccinate their kids and a possibly not unjustified anger at being banned from their children's school because they couldn't go on school grounds if they weren't vaccinated. But then on the other hand, there's this group of parents who are petrified because, you know, brother, sister, cousin, uncle, whatever, dad, mum is immunocompromised and all the other kids aren't wearing masks and none of the other kids are vaccinated. So they're worried about bringing it home. So with the review into the Education Act in Queensland, because I've been helping people with their responses, you know, you get your libertarian types, religious types, secular types, all of these people together, pulling together because they don't like what the government has proposed for home educators. And if they can do that, Rebecca, why can't the rest of us, why can't we talk across the aisle anymore? <laughs> and I think yeah. that's what I find so interesting about home educators is the capacity to see my enemy's enemy as my friend and to work across the aisle and pull together to try and make things better for those young people. I suppose that's one of the ways to approach it is to look at it from what values you have in common and go, all right, you know, we all care about our children. We want the best for them. It's challenging, I think, to go, all right, fair enough. There are some things that we as a society, as a culture have gone, yeah, children shouldn't be exposed to that. That's that's not appropriate. Where we draw the line, it definitely differs from each person. So trying to find a consensus is always going to be incredibly difficult. I mean, really, in a way, and there was a paper out of the US a few years ago from a lady named Gina Riley, and she looked at LGBTIQ plus issues in home education. And she found that particularly trans and LGB kids, so lesbian, gay, bisexual kids, actually were happier in home education because they didn't hear the that's gay miss constantly told to them. There's no policy around what you have to wear. Home educated children wear their own clothes. So, you know, if you have a little boy who wants to wear a tutu and have his hair really long, well, he's a little boy who turns up to your homeschool co-op in a tutu with his hair really long. There's no pressure to conform in the same way. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's a significant part of it. And I think, too, for those kids who are struggling in school because they just don't fit into that box. So a friend of mine weirdly out of the blue after the pandemic email and said you know my daughter's in grade seven how do I homeschool her because she's telling me she's going to off herself if I send her back to school because she just didn't want to fit into those boxes anymore and I think this is all part of what we need to be talking about and this is why I think that what home education sort of says is what does it mean to be an educated Australian why do we have to wear a uniform if we're a going to school like why I understand there's that socioeconomic thing but I was a poor kid in a rich school believe me the other kids knew I was poor even yeah. though we were all in the same uniform it there's was always like, indicators it's not yeah because of my lunchbox or what was in my lunchbox or my sneakers which weren't mandated or what brand of brown shoes I wore which wasn't the same as the rich kids all wearing their brand of brown shoes you know all of those things it doesn't fix any of that stuff and there's tons of research that came out particularly in the noughts which looked at uniforms and really they're a disciplinary measure and a marketing tool for schools they have very little to do with governing that kind of socioeconomic thing which puts us all in the same category it's more of a conformity 
thing, isn't it? And I suppose you could question whether from the government's perspective, that's a goal for education to march children into, you know, the the line can form them and then get them into productive roles in society. We need to be thinking about what do we want from young people? What does it mean to be educated? How can we do that? And are the ways that we do it the best ways to serve young people and the community's needs? I think everybody, home educators, democratic schools, state schools, everybody would agree. Kids need to be literate and they need to be numerate, right? I don't think that anybody would disagree with that. But do they have to learn about modern history? I loved modern history at school. Huge World War II nut. I'll put that out there. I don't care how bad that makes me look. I am very interested in the Second World War. Just the war in Europe and just from Operation Barbarossa to the end. Don't care about the rest of it. That's my shtick. But there's lots of people for whom that is pretty much irrelevant. There are people who their whole lives without ever knowing about Operation Barbarossa. You probably don't know what Operation Barbarossa is. No, I don't. <laughs> that up after this and you know you've gotten this far without knowing it and if you didn't know it tomorrow or the next day I'm fairly sure that won't make a huge difference but we need to be asking if maybe the model is working so in democratic schools they have a completely different model where they'll offer choices to young people and the kids can then vote and go yeah I'm really interested in learning about dragons so everything comes back to this theme about dragons because you know There's science, there's art, there's English. We can measure the size of different dragons and how realistic they would be. We could even do things where we look at if they had scales this big, would they be able to walk or this big or whatever? You know, all the things can come back if we just give young people more opportunities. So it's a really creative way of getting that engagement. Like you're still teaching the same things, you're just using a different way. Because I can see that there's, I think, an importance in throwing a lot of things at kids to like see what sticks kind of thing just because you need that exposure or you're never going to know what you're interested in. So in New South Wales there's a different school and they're in a really low socioeconomic area and what they experimented with was taking the primary school kids and giving them after school activities and clubs. So you know you're in grade five and you're interested in forensic science. So they bring some forensic scientists in and they talk to the kids about it and you go ew, icky, don't like blood, not for me. I'm actually really interested in oil and cars. I'm going to have a look at cars. So then a mechanic will come in and you can choose to be part of the mechanics club. And next term you can be choose to be part of, I don't know, the, what's that water pearling thing? You know, when you do the pretty colors in the water and you yeah, think about that kind of stuff, that might be your shtick. And from that, you explore a whole bunch of different things that enliven in you the passions that you have. And there is nothing wrong with being really into mechanics and not being into forensic science, just as there's nothing wrong with being into forensic science and not into mechanics. You know, the world needs forensic scientists and mechanics, you know. Yeah, yeah. And people who do absolutely. Well, absolutely. <laughs> so I think that's really where we need to be thinking and looking, and I don't think we are. And I think that's why people wind up back at homeschooling because their child is bored. So of course they're flicking the pen at the other child or, you know, snipping the student in front of them's hair or, you know, insert whatever silly thing the child has done. The other problem I think too, Rebecca, if I'm really honest, is we belittle young people in a way that we as adults would be horrified if people did it to us. So I think back to my own teaching experience and I taught in some really tough, tough schools And one of them was a a tough Catholic school, but we used to take kids who'd been kicked out of the local state school. And, you know, you'd get the roll and there'd be the red dots for, oh, you've got so-and-so, oh, so-and-so, oh my gosh, don't let them sit together, you know, the things. Right. So I remember having a child who was a a red highlight, like properly circled on the roll. And I was studying my master's and I was looking at Bourdieu who argues about cultural capital. And he says, schools test what they don't teach. They test how middle class you are. They can't teach you how to be middle class because that's something that you just have to grow up in. So really we're disadvantaging young people. And it's not really any surprise that we spit out at the other end of schooling exactly the same social class that they came in. And a few of them jump up so we can tell ourselves that we're actually making things better. But ultimately most kids wind up coming out at the end exactly how they came in right so I think you know the best predictor of whether you'll go to university has traditionally been whether your father went so you know reinforcing this idea so talking about social and cultural capital with this student and he turned to me and he said holy ass miss that makes absolute perfect sense to me and explains why I've always struggled to feel comfortable 
and part of this environment. You know, I'm, I'm not raised for this. You know, I don't know that he had a front door. And if you don't have a front door and you don't have lunch or money for lunch, that it's really hard to listen to math C or, you know, calculus or algebra and see a link to your life. Yeah, that there's that real disconnect, isn't there? It's just like a different world to the one you living live in. in. Yeah. And he showed me that, you know, this is a really complex, I was doing a master's by, you know, a philosophy, like it was a theoretical concept I was using to explain my data. And here's this year 11 kid who is notionally illiterate, but having this high level conversation of applying Borgesian theory to his own life. And I really feel like we disadvantage young people when we think because they're acting up they're stupid and they're too stupid to get some really interesting ideas and that maybe they would be better served by us having conversations about different theoretical approaches and philosophies and ideas and helping engaging them as people really instead of oh my goodness yeah. so <laughs> people they're children you can't do that <laughs> And, you know, yeah. and maybe then too, if we did that, and I, I don't know what you believe, I don't believe in young earth creationism because I, I don't see any evidence for it in the world. And maybe if we had those kind of conversations, then people might start to look at it and go, where are some other areas of my life where people are telling me stuff? Maybe it doesn't really work for me or does it make logical sense? Maybe we can do things like talking about logic. And, you know, a lot of home educators take an approach that comes from teaching logic and they teach Latin and they look at the roots of words. And, you know, if you look at that, you start to understand why, you know, we might use our particular word in a particular context and how using that word changes our perspective on that context. And we get into this whole prison house of language stuff, which I don't think there are any young people who wouldn't really engage with those ideas if we actually shared it with them and we had open and honest and interesting conversations with them as like you said as as people as human beings just like that and then we're also talking across the aisle Rebecca we're starting to talk to people who maybe don't share our perspective and we're testing our own beliefs because we're challenging them with other people's but we're also you know engaging with different concepts and if we find an idea then in that sort of young person space it's kind of okay to go oh you know what I used to think x actually you've made a really compelling case for y so I'm going to abandon x and go with y and that might also help us not fall for conspiracy theories it is about encouraging critical thinking you think that that maybe is something that we should add along with like numeracy and and literacy you know the building blocks for approaching and understanding the world yeah (laughs) schools do it like there's philosophy taught in schools you know there's a few schools around here that do it but not every school and part of the problem though is that the curriculum's really crowded if we can't shove this kind of logical thinking in there as an addendum to whatever we do it's just like then it becomes this weird mixture unfortunately with schools kind of where we're at we're just mixing all these colors in and we get brown and part of it is that we spend a lot of time teaching to tests and we do a lot of testing and This is part of how we do school now. That seems like such a backwards approach in a lot of ways. You go to school, you do a test and, you know, whatever you score on that test, well, that's how you do at that. We're not teaching people to actually succeed at a task or anything like that because you can't, you know, just retake the test and, you know, keep going until you actually learn whatever the thing is that you're trying to learn. It's just like, all right, how well have you learned it? And just keep moving on. I think that's part of like, you know, the beginning of this, you said to me, you don't need to worry about statistics. And I'm like, phew, this is not going to be anything. (laughs) It was another day where I didn't have to do an exam. We teach kids how to take tests and they get really, really good at taking tests. So maybe a lot of the stuff that we value at school is actually not terribly valuable. And increasingly that I think feeds into parents choosing homeschooling or alternative education because they go, well, you know, Sally or Billy can get into university if that's where their path lies, or they could get an apprenticeship or they could, you know, do a job without doing hardcore English literature, which maybe they're not particularly interested in. So maybe that's not a pathway that we necessarily need to go down. And I don't know, like I did school in the 90s and I remember the girl sitting in front of me who was my friend. She 
turned around to me in the middle of that like big exam she said I don't feel so good and then vomited all over my paper like (laughs) (laughs) yeah it can be very stressful as well you know I think maybe that's not really right either and maybe that contributes to some of the issues we see with young people if you're putting that amount of pressure on like you know your entire future depends on how you do at this exam it's really catastrophizing something that true. doesn't need to be yeah no, it's not even true universities will take you if you can show a predisposition to being able to pass let's solve all the world's problems right here about <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Read exactly. the whole curriculum. All of this is all part of the issue and part of why I think we see a growth in alternatives to mainstream school because parents are just questioning whether this really is right. You mentioned that you did really well at, at school and had that like dopamine hit and found it easy. Did you ever encounter an issue where that meant that you didn't learn how to overcome problems as well? Like, because that, that's something that I encountered myself where, you know, it was really, really easy until it wasn't. You know, you get to the end of school and you go to university and it keeps coming and then you get to the end of university and then where's my badge for turning up, right? There's nothing, nobody cares. You you know, I'm expected to turn up and teach my classes on time, but there's no bells and whistles for that. I don't know, you're getting bells and whistles for turning up on time because I'm no. not. <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? You get, you get a little gold star. And- <laughs> life isn't like that. We're not really preparing people for how life actually is. It's just an expectation that you turn up. I'm taken back to my PhD when I was doing my PhD and my supervisor told me one week that I was dumb. And I said to her, oh, okay, why are you bothering me? And the next week she said, oh, I don't think you're dumb. I think you're a lazy thinker. And she was right. Like I am a lazy thinker. I am somebody who, if I find a path of least resistance, Rebecca, I am taking that path, let me tell you. And I'm looking around, scanning for that path constantly because thinking is hard. And that's why most people don't spend their lives thinking. And this student of mine, what was so amazing about it was, and I think if we get them young, they won't mind thinking because it's something that they're already starting to do. They're at this point in their lives where they're trying to figure out who they are. So they're already thinking. So maybe- yeah. We talked to them then and we got them through school. We started thinking about thinking at school. Maybe things would be different and better and they might be more critical and creative thinkers who are engaged. That's the problem with education. You have uh, pressures at home that may prevent you from having the time or effort as well to think really. Like if, if you're sort of just focused on survival and you've got like a really turbulent home life and, and things like that, there's too much going on. There's no space in your life to like really engage with education. And I think that sort of needs to be addressed on a systemic level. Like the, the child from my analogy is someone who's turned up to school as many days as he had to. So the truant officer didn't turn up. And he's somebody who was told constantly at school, this is not the right place for you. But, you know, learning or earning, mate, he has to be there. So, you know, we force people to go to a place that tells them that they're dumb daily yeah. <laughs> for 13 years but then the, the flip side of that is I have I remember having another student and I saw him sitting on the stairs at the oval and I said to him mate why are you at school it's exam block you don't need to be here and he said miss if I don't turn up today nobody will say my name no one will say hello to me I won't really be acknowledged so most of the home educated people I see and I do not wish to maintain a stereotype have parents who are really 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 engaged in them so they have a real passion to make sure their children are better. They must do because they quit their jobs to help their child who's struggling at school. The majority of parents do that. But then there's parents who are really engaged, but there's also parents who aren't. And for those people, really, that was my job as a teacher was to get them through. Yeah, I always say to my students every year, I said, I don't care what you teach them. They aren't going to remember. Just love them. You know, just give them some love. Pour something into their cups because that's really what they... Yeah, I think that that's really important. Yes. And I think that really we don't do enough of that as teachers because we don't have time because we've got to do the entrance tests and we've got to make sure that they're performing and have we done our marking and we've got to do this and that. And really our job is a relational job as parents and as teachers it's about developing a relationship with another human being that makes them feel valued and then they'll feed that back to you as a a parent or a home educator or or in a democratic school how do you handle difficult children that's a really interesting question because what does it mean to be a difficult child 
So democratic educators, quite a lot of home educators, although not all of them, some of them are really hardcore, like straight down the line parents, but let's take them off the table. So your democratic school teacher, your parent who is trying to be, you know, not authoritarian with their children and the home educators who are the same, they would look at a child's behavior and they would see communication. So, you know, if your kid is kicking off at Coles because you won't give them that Mars bar that they've seen on the counter and they really want it and they've reached for it and you've said no and they then kick off, well, how, what are they communicating with that? Well, firstly, obviously they they want the <laughs> want the Mars yeah. bar. Oh, yeah, hundred percent. Who doesn't? They're pretty good. <laughs> Although I'm more of a Tim Tam person myself. Like, uh, my guilty pleasure is still Tim Tam. But you know, I think we have to say to ourselves, why are they doing this? Well, partly it's that they really want that thing, but also partly it's because they've said no. Now. No happens in all sorts of places. You know, when the police officer puts his lights on and pulls up behind my car, my heart is in my throat and I am literally just like shaking because I'm so nervous. And then if the police officer gives me a ticket, well, I'm probably going to cry because I'm really nervous. I've got into trouble, don't like getting into trouble. And now I'm down 260 bucks because I was not paying attention. I was singing along to the Smiths, don't judge me. And I was doing 70 in a 60 zone, right? Why is it okay for us to cry? when the police officer gives a speeding ticket, but it's not okay for the kids to cry because we've said no to the Mars bar. And I think we also have to think too, okay, what else was going on? I was singing along to the Smiths, but is it, you know, four o'clock in the afternoon, are they hungry? Are they thirsty? Are they bored? Should we have yep. chosen another time to do this? Could we have done it online? You know, so many other factors play into it. So I think for all of those groups, when they're parenting, they try really hard to see the child's behavior as an unmet need or as communication. And one of the other things that parents do, which really, okay, now I'm going to do like what grinds my gears, is parents talk too much to their children, right? Like, you know, you see them out and about and they're like, at the start, at the intersection, we're going to stop. And I don't want you to look around at anything else. I just want you to stop there. Don't move. Don't do anything. Just stop. And they'll give this like Trieste on why the child has to stop at the intersection. And like, I'm confused as a PhD qualified adult when really all they need to do was at the intersection, I need you to stop. And if this kid says why, then we can go, well, because if you keep walking, you're going to run into a car and you could die. <laughs> like that's it. Or you know, it's going to hurt if you smack into a car. But we don't need to offer that necessarily unless they ask for it. Because you know what? They probably heard you saying, well, cars are dangerous. Don't go near them. So they're probably aware that cars aren't safe. Or, you know, you're hitting your brother. Hitting hurts. I'm not going to let you hit your brother. And if you keep doing it, mm, I see you having trouble not hitting your brother. I'm going to take you to another room and sit with you so we can talk about why it is you're hitting your brother. And then you just listen and they'll cry and they'll rage and they'll be angry. But that's because those feelings were inside them and that's why they were hitting their brother. They weren't, you know, they're not being deliberately nefarious. They don't, they don't want to give their brother a hematoma. They just, they were frustrated. So they smacked out. Yeah, they, they act out. They've got that like emotional dysregulation happening and they yeah, I do. My personal experience is a brother who has a, a lot of like anger issues. He, he had ODD and so that was very challenging. So I've, I've definitely seen firsthand how confrontational a child can be. And, and so that's sort of like a real personal question is like, how should my mother have handled that? Like <laughs> kids on the spectrum, you know, if they're high functioning, then you don't need to give them an entire diatribe of what needs to happen. You can just go, hey, kid, we need to stop. Or running with scissors could hurt you or someone else. I'm not going to let you do it. And the other thing that you can do is remove those things that are a problem. So put the knives up high, move the scissors so they're up high, you know, lock the gate so they don't leave, you know, all sorts of things that you can do. Yeah. You get it, the postman comes out to be a problem, but, you know, otherwise just put a like latch on the gate something so the kid knows that there's no point in trying to leave so you don't have to set as many rules if you set the place up so that change the environment basically to suit yeah, the child exactly. yeah because it's yeah. easier to change the environment than it is to change the child unless you're happy to keep yelling and yelling and yelling and saying the same thing over and over again which does your head in after a while yeah I don't think anyone really enjoys that and I think that just teaches the kid that you know anger and yelling is an appropriate response to having that, that emotion. I have uh, one last question that I often argue with my husband about this, and it's about the ethical question of telling kids about Santa and, and whether oh. or not Santa exists. 
The Santa thing is hard because do you have children? I don't. I have nieces and nephews. Do they believe in Santa? Yes. Okay. You probably know not to tell them, right? Because you know that that's what their parents have decided and that's okay. I have three children of my own and we don't do the Santa thing. It just kind of never happened for us. And yeah. also Santa's a grifter. Like he's just stealing your thunder. I don't want <laughs> an imaginary man stealing my thunder. You should have seen the Easter presents I got them. Oh my goodness. I don't want some stupid bunny stealing <laughs> thunder with that, right? Like it's like, my money. I did this. I did this effort. Yeah. <laughs> I the pajamas that I wrapped beautifully. Yes, I did that. That makes me sound like a narcissist. I'm sorry. I try really hard not to be narcissistic. But I think it's up to parents to do what they like. Again, we're back to those young earth creationists. If it's okay for you to tell your kid that Jesus is Lord, which it is okay to say that, it's also okay for me to not have Santa. So I think about one of my nieces who's petrified of Santa because really? he's, a fat, he's a fat man who comes into your house. <laughs> yeah. We don't have a chimney. How do we get, how does he get in? And he sees me when I'm sleeping and he knows when I'm awake. Like, how? <laughs> well, right, isn't it? When you really think about it, it yeah. is kind of creepy, right? So I never did it. It never really came up. I don't want to lie to my children. I don't lie about all sorts of things. Like they have anatomical names for their body because I genuinely don't want to have to later on explain no that's not a such and such it's a such and such okay do you know and all of it is about respect so for me as a parent and the parents that I work with and like research the only real rule they have is respect and it's kind of disrespectful to lie my own approach is is probably based on my, my experience with my own parents to not tell them explicitly that Santa's not real and not to ruin the, the illusion and, and experience. But if they ever ask, like, you know, is Santa real, then let them figure it out. That's how my parents approached it. As soon as I was questioning it and they go, what do you think? And I was like, no, it's not really real. And they go, well, there you go. Like, it, it was just like, allowing me to discover that. So I valued that experience personally. My perspective on it is that it pre presents a narrative that isn't real. And you grow up and you learn more and discover that it isn't real. And so it's breaking the illusion that everything you're told by an adult is true. So it, it led me to question what authorities were telling me. I see that value for children and I go, Yep. You know, they get all excited and stuff like that. And it's like, okay, that's fine. But my, my husband's like adamantly against it. And he's like, you know, it's, it's lying to children. It's a hard one. I think when I thought about it more and more, I remember being a child and being at school and my mother coming into the literacy rotation and some kids saying, oh, you know, Santa's not real. And I turned to my mother and I mouthed to her, he is real, isn't she? Isn't he? And she said, oh yes, of course. So I'd be like, bold, bold. Right. Face. Yeah. That, that's yeah. full, just like lie. Yeah. And then but I think too, people talk about Santa as like the fantasy and you, know, you create this world. The thing is that what you're doing is you're deliberately fabricating an imaginary thing that you know isn't real and your partner knows isn't real and your parents know isn't real and anyone over the age of about eight knows isn't real. But you maintain this illusion and it's not like other lies where, you know, you might say, oh, I, you know, I tried really hard at something. Well, maybe you didn't try really hard. I don't know. It's not like some other lies that get told, but I think I didn't do it because I think it sets people up to fall for an illusion. And it's not really that creative. It's creative if the child invents their own Santa story that we all tell, or, you know, they have their own ideas and we, we follow those. That's creativity. Right. Yeah. It's really creative. If I've constructed a narrative that is I know a lie and you don't. And I'm, what I'm really doing, it's actually quite condescending in a way. It's patting you on the head going, oh, look at you. You don't know Santa's not real. I suppose that I enjoyed making up games as a kid. And mm -hmm. I also enjoyed it when the adults were making up games. My grandmother used to take me down the street and we'd go hunt for fairies in the garden. And that, that was, you know, and she'd be like, oh, there's a fairy over there. And I'd be like, I recognized that it wasn't real that we were playing. I can see that it can prep people for like just going along with the, like Emperor's New Clothes kind of thing where they're, they're, you know, too afraid to like. You knew there weren't fairies, but you were playing along. My children know there's no Santa, but sometimes they play along. They ask, for example, for tooth fairy money, but also we they wanted to get one of those little doors that the fairy could come and go from. And they're having this huge imaginative world, but 
it's on their terms. They are 100% in control of it. They know yeah. there's no tooth theory. Todd Tooth, who writes the notes, doesn't exist. But they'll, they'll say, I'd love it if Todd Tooth gave me a note with my money. So fair enough, I'll write a note. And we all know that Todd Tooth doesn't exist. But, you know. Making it explicit, I can see that that's like, you know, like this is explicitly a game, but we can still play it. Like, yeah, that, like you did with the fairies, right? With your grandmother. Yeah, you knew yeah. There weren't fairies there. I knew with my grandmother there weren't fairies either. But it was fun to play along and you know it's in that kind of imaginative world that young people can be in and you're part of it with them and I think that's you're letting them lead the way again we're giving them agency and control yeah. over yeah. their world I really believe in agency because I didn't have that as a child my parents were very authoritarian very strict there was no space for me in that particular family to be anything except exactly what my parents expected me to be and yeah. I can see the impact of that longer term and on relationships. And, you know, ultimately, I don't want that with my own children. And I, for me, it's about agency. But you know what? They'll have something that I have done. And, you know, that's, I think, part of what we're doing. And I think we're all just doing the very best we can with what we have in front of us. And Santa, not Santa, democratic school, state school, I don't think it makes any difference if at your heart you really just want to do what's best for your child and you work with that child and you let them lead you. You know, I think it's like when I was a kid, we used to go to the beach and it was a really like rough beach. It's in the North coast in Queensland. So, you know, kind of North of Brisbane, kind of rough. And my favorite thing to do was to swim out past the breakers and just float. And I think we kind of just, you know, just moving along with that water and just floating. And I think that's really a metaphor for parenting is we have to swim back into the shore right we have to work our way through those breakers but there are lots of times where we can just float yeah yeah let our children lead I mean there are things that are no they can't play with knives because they'll probably hurt themselves they can't run on the road because they'll get hit by a car you know they can't start a fire in the middle of your house because mine's wooden so they they'll burn the house down so there's lots of no's that are no's for me as well as for them but there's a lot of stuff that can be yeah okay and just floating out past those breakers yeah yeah I, I definitely see the the value in that um so I think that's all we, we've gone a bit over time there it's just really engaging conversation so <laughs> I'm sure you say that to all the girls <laughs> <laughs> no but thank you so much for joining me today it's been a real pleasure and I thank think you. um 